Hey, what's up? John Sanmez here from simpleprogrammer.com. So I got a, a very exciting guest today. I, I've been I've been fortunate to be able to speak to so many really cool people and just really high profile oh, people on, on the channel here. And so I've, I've got one for you that I, I think you guys are going to love because because this guy is very dynamic, very interesting life and career. Uh, his name is Marshall Silver. And he, it, it's it's difficult to describe what he does because he's done so many things. From he's he's um, done hi, uh, hypnotist shows. Uh, I I saw that uh, that he's got a, a huge number of of awesome seminars. I, I'd actually like to attend one of the seminars sometime and check that out. And uh, and been on uh, countless television programs, right? Uh, Vegas Vegas Entertainer. Uh, am I am, am I getting something wrong, or <laughs> actually, why don't you just fill us in with with everything that uh, you know? Who are you? What 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 have you done? <laughs> well, when I find myself, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, John, I'm so happy to be on your on your program. <clears throat> yeah, I have been blessed. I've done a lot of things. I, you know, I am a hypnotist, and I uh, with my show, I have the world's largest hypnotic production show. I have appeared on the main stage of most hotels here in Las Vegas and around the world. I also am an educator. We have a number of different programs that we've been teaching for over three decades to people in both personal and business development. I am a published author. Simon & Schuster published uh, my first book called Passion, Profit, and Power. I, uh, <clears throat> these days, have been retired. And uh, the reason I retired is, you know, there's a Buddhist curse that says, may all of your greatest desires be instantaneously fulfilled. And when I was growing up and starting my career out, I thought, how could that possibly be a curse? You get everything you want until I got everything that I wanted. Yes, I've appeared on Late Night with David Letterman a half a dozen times. I've appeared on the Howard Stern Show a bunch of times. I've appeared on Donnie Deutsch's Big Idea, Montel Williams, and just every place that I had wanted to go to. And uh, one day, you know, I met the love of my life 10 years ago. And uh, we, uh, I was actually doing a seminar in Boston. There was a thousand people in the room. I walked up the center aisle and I saw this beautiful young woman and I was instantly smitten. And, and I hypnotized her while I was teaching the class to a thousand other people. I hypnotized her to come ask me out on a, a, a date on the break. Yeah. She came up, she asked me out on the date. And as they say, uh, you know, 10 years later, we've got uh, three very beautiful kids. When my son Sterling Silver was born, I caught him in my hands in the bathtub. He was born at home in the bathtub. No drugs, no doctors, no pain. Wow. Uh, a lot of people would say all the babies were conceived by hypnosis too. And I won't argue with them. But the... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, when Sterling was born, I'd already done everything that I'd wanted to do. I'd done over $220 million in personal sales, and I'd traveled around the world. I had an infomercial that did over $120 million all by itself in sales in the very first year. Like I said, I'd published all the books that I wanted to publish. I, I created movies and everything else. And so when Sterling was born, I looked into his eyes, and I said, you know what? I just want to retire. I just want to you know, spend the rest of my life with my beautiful bride and my son and travel all over the world. Well, then Maximus was born in the bathtub. I caught him in my hands, caught his umbilical cord, and I'm looking into his eyes, and I'm going, I just want to travel all over the world with you guys. And then my daughter Prosperity was born, and I, I looked into her eyes, and I thought, little girls are really expensive. I should get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But the challenge for me was that I had done everything that I'd wanted to do. I produced a movie. I'd executive produced a movie and started it and wrote it. Um, I'd already written the books that I wanted to write. I'd already you know, been everywhere I wanted to be in multiple languages worldwide. And so for me to come out of retirement, there was a, you know, there had to be something really big. And even when I looked into my daughter's eyes and I knew that I wanted to come out of retirement, I, I still didn't know what it was that I wanted to do. Right. It yeah. took me a little while and it took me just paying attention to what was going on in the world. And, you know, I'm a baby boomer. I'm a little, a little bit older than you are. And as a baby boomer, I, I see a lot of people that are my generation older that are in really bad places right now. Their retirement isn't gonna last them. They don't know where to go. Technology has changed so much that they just can't keep up. And some people that are kind of confused, you know, even, even that were born into the technology, even millennials that just aren't sure of where they wanna go. And I realized that there is something beyond hypnosis. What hypnosis is, is helping you to see the world in its most ideal state and then respond accordingly. And so, you know, my job as a hypnotist has always been to help people have new beliefs and act upon those beliefs, whether it was believing they could speak a language from another planet in my show, or whether it was them believing that they were a millionaire, even if the money had not yet been deposited in their bank account. My job was always to change beliefs. Well, I realized after all these years that there is something that goes beyond belief. There is something that goes beyond programming, and that is certainty. That when we come from a place of certainty and we know that our success is certain, then what happens is 
you know, we, we don't doubt it. And when hiccups occur or when there's bumps in the road or when we're running and we feel that pain like we can't go on, we say, no, I'm finishing this race. There's no way around this thing. I'm finishing this. And what right. most people don't realize is that the majority of their successes and failures in life, the majority of the 95% of them are mental. It has nothing to do with the circumstance. It has nothing to do with what's going on in the world. It has everything to do with what's going on in their head. Totally, totally agree. agree. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, wow, that's, 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 that's so, so interesting. I, I love kids', kids names name. as well. I have to point that out. That those are, are so, such great, great names. Name. Um, well, a lot of people don't realize that names are very hypnotic. And, you know, whatever our name is, we hear that on a regular basis. And if we hear that on a regular basis, we become whatever we envision that name should be. My name, Marshall Silver, literally means to gather money. If you marshal a resource, you gather it up, and silver, of course, is silver. Uh, I was always wanting to have a son named, named Sterling Silver. You know, when I was a young man, I always thought, what a great thing, what a great gift to give to somebody. Some yeah. people, when we told them that our son's name was Sterling Silver, they'd, they'd look at me kind of oddly and go, oh, you, you cursed that boy forever. And my response is, uh, I don't think so. This boy's right. going to walk up to a teenage girl as a teen himself. He's going to walk up and he's going to see her. Hi, my name's Sterling Silver. And she's going to melt at his feet before she even gets to know the guy. Right. And so, you know, Maximus, uh, we originally were going to name him Maximilian Silver. And right before my wife gave birth, she was doing some research. And it turns out that a Maximilian is a small Maximus. So I said, my son's not going to be a small anything. So we named him Maximilian. Uh, I had no plans to have a daughter. I really thought I was only going to have one child. Had no plans to have a daughter. When we found out that uh, my wife was pregnant with our daughter, uh, I didn't have a name. But I came up with a name and I said, my challenge is I don't have a nickname for her and right. my wife thought about it we were walking along the beach one day and she said what about how about we call prosperity pretty p-r-i-t-y the first two letters and the last three letters of her name as her nickname so now all day long she's two years old so all day long she'll walk up to people i'm pretty i'm pretty i'm pretty so it's awesome nice i love that that's awesome that's great i i gotta say you know just looking at your and everything you've done in, in your site and everything, you, uh, of, as far as branding and, and, and image, I, I've never seen someone that has created a more crafted, like really solid image brand that, that it's just, it's really cool. I, I, I really, like as someone who like helps software developers build their brands, I, I really appreciate that. I got to say that. Well, I love that. You know, and it's so important because again, reality is created by validation. What a lot of people don't know about my history is I was born into a, a family that was dirt poor. I have nine brothers and sisters, and we had no running water. We had no electricity. We had no food. Food uh, Often we had no housing at all. We were homeless twice. And the second house I lived in was a converted chicken coop. And I was seven years old when we moved into that house. And that house was heaven to me. Even though it was a yeah. converted chicken coop, it had running water, it had electricity. And other than other than clucking once in a while when I get happy, no adverse side effects. <laughs> nice. But these so, days, we're, we're no, talking about my 17,000 square foot palace here in Las Vegas. Uh, we also have a home down on the beach, as I was telling you, in San Diego. I've lived in San Diego since uh, 1976. And I travel all over the world in private jets, changing people's lives. And, and we're, this weekend, we're actually jumping on a private jet. We're headed down to a place called Necker Island, which is Sir Richard Branson's private island. Oh, I'll, yes, yeah. I'll spend a week with Sir Richard and just hanging out, vacationing. And, you know, again, it's, it's a lifestyle that if somebody had told me when I was in my late teens addicted to cocaine and marijuana, early 20s when I was struggling so much that it was going to turn out this way, I wouldn't have believed them. Yet, had I been certain at that time that it was going to turn out this way, I certainly wouldn't have struggled the way that I did. So, you know, that's, that's part of the reason I want to help people get that certainty that they seek is so that they don't, they, they don't have that doubt. They don't have those fears and they don't have that trepidation. Now, one thing I mean that you brought up that I think is is something that it's a recurring theme. I think with with my with my channel with my audience, a lot of people on on YouTube, a lot of, a lot of people maybe have limited means or have backgrounds that are they're kind of harsh they're adversity, right? So I I see this. I mean, and and I see this from from my from my perspective and just hearing your story and so many of the successful people you know i'm a big uh, big follower of tony robbins and, and he's got a you know a, a similar story and it's like so the most successful people i ever talk to always have huge adversity earlier in life what, what do you think about that like is that is that true i mean you know is it because because i think a lot of people get stuck in this mindset of saying well 
man, I, I, you guys are fortunate or you're lucky or, you know, you're privileged or whatever. And they, and they don't realize that adversity sometimes is, is like the, is the gift that, that, that you need. Uh, what, what's your take on that? I think that part of the challenge for people is that the human condition, the programs, as it were, is that people want an excuse for not succeeding. And if they have an excuse for not succeeding, they don't have to feel bad about it. You know, if the only excuse is they didn't actually do what they needed to do, then, then a person has to kick themselves over that excuse. And so when, when I'm helping people, I, I tell people, here's what you need to do. You need to find a mentor. Do not attempt to figure everything out all by yourself. You need to find a mentor who, uh, number one, started off worse than where you are right now. That's essential. If you find I like that. Yeah. Off worse than where you are right now, you've got no excuses. The second thing is, is, you know, start and then find somebody who actually has done what they say they're teaching you to do. Uh, and, yeah. and can provide validation, can provide proof. You know, for me, uh, you know, having traveled all over the world and shared the stage with so many different people, it's been my life. I've been on the platform since I was seven years old. I've been doing uh, educational seminars since I was 23 years old. And it's just been a lifetime. And the, the third thing, though, that I think is important that sometimes people don't think about when they're seeking a mentor, they just want to find somebody to teach them, is you need to find somebody whose lifestyle is a lifestyle that you would like to live. Hmm. You know, there, there's a book. It's called The Millionaire Next Door. And I am not a fan of the book. And I'll tell you why I'm not a fan of the book. The reason yeah. I'm not a fan is the book is all about people who work their butts off their whole lives, drove beat up old pickup trucks, uh, lived in cardboard box houses, and then they died multimillionaires. And I'm right. thinking, why would you want to do that? What's the point in doing all of that? You know, for me, I like living well. I, I like living in a 17,000 square foot palace. I like having, you know, the freedom to go wherever I want to go. I like taking my family on $150,000 week vacations. And the reason that we're able to do that is I view the world in a way that most people don't and everybody can. And that right. is that whatever anyone else can do, I can do too. And so I think that a lot of times I see people in, obviously people in the programming space, there are people that have become DECA billionaires in under yeah. five years in the programming space. There's countless examples of success inside of that space and that's where people need to look. The challenge is, you know, it's kind of like any profession, People that are wanting to succeed often look at all the people that fail and say, well, here's proof that only one or two people actually succeed. And my right. response to that is, why are you studying the people that didn't? Why aren't right. you studying the people that do? Because those are the ones that can make it happen. And I, I think in this day and age, you know, we've never seen a time where people could become DECA billionaires 10 times over in under five years. And we're seeing example after example after example right now. So that should be very encouraging for everybody. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's I I love that that mindset. I I love that those concepts that you express. It, it it's so so true. There's such a, a opportunity. It, it's it seems like so much of it is like you said that certainty or that mindset. I always I've got a shirt I, that I sell on, and I not with well, well for my main uh, channel here and for for my company, and I have it on. It says trust the process on it. Yep. And it's about it's about that. It's like when you know when you're not worried about the results, when you just know it's going to happen. That mindset, that that certainty, is so powerful. And then and you shape reality. To, it's it's amazing how how much that that makes a difference. And and so many people are so easily discouraged today, and, and don't they don't they don't really believe. Well, here's 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 what I loved about your show, uh, John. Mm -hmm. When you came across my desk, and I and I did some research to see what kind of a uh, program you had. Here's what I loved about it. The human mind is a computer. Our subconscious right. mind is a computer. Our conscious mind is the gatekeeper to that computer. So right. what hypnosis is, is hypnosis is setting aside the gatekeeper, the conscious mind, speaking directly into the subconscious computer and allowing right. those things to be real. You know, if a, if a programmer is sitting down to program a piece of software, what they do is they begin with the end in mind. They start with what's, what's the final result I'm looking for and where are we now? Then what they do is they seek to have, you know, good user interface. How do I make this thing work the way the brain works so it's intuitive? And they keep working through those bugs until they get a reasonable facsimile of what the original design or desire was. And I right. think about that, the, the, the challenge for most people is they live their lives in a way different way than they program software. Software is never right. It is never perfect. There are always, right. you can't get rid of them. And so you have to put out crap and then put out crap 2.0 and then do it again right. and then again. And so when people live by that adage of rehearse, review, revise, everything gets easier. But I think the biggest 
challenge. And, and certainly I believe people that work in, in the tech space, in the, in the online or programming space, I think the biggest challenge is, is oftentimes people have too big a concern for other people's opinions of them. Yes. And so when you, when you lose the need for other people's approval, what happens is everything gets easier. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I That's how I define freedom is, you know, I've, I've done quite a few videos where I talk about what freedom is. And to me, freedom is is really the best way to look at it is that you you don't care what other people think. That, because like, you they, like yourself. Yeah. And it's not an arrogant thing. It's just that you like yourself and you're comfortable in your own skin, so you don't need their approval. Right. And I, I really question how you can really ge genuinely, sincerely like someone else if you don't like yourself. Yeah. I, I've you know, I, I just find it, it's, it's difficult to be selfless until you're selfish first, you know, to, to some degree, but uh, agree. there's a book, it's called Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. I love that book. I love that book. Too. She also yeah. wrote The Fountainhead. There's another book that she wrote that a lot of people yeah. have never heard of that I think is phenomenal. And everybody that's listening right now and watching this podcast, they should check it out. It's called The Virtues of Selfishness. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people think that being selfish is wrong. And, and again, the adage of you're on a jet, they, they, you know, they lose oxygen. They tell you, put your mask on first. Because if you don't yeah. put your mask on, you're going to pass out. You can't help anybody. So I think that it's really important for people to do that, to say, you know, okay, how do I take care of myself? And then once I know that I can, I'm stabilized, then I can go take care of other people. You know, my mother with 10 kids, um, throughout the course of my life, the one thing I'm most proud of is I was there the day that my mother got her first Social Security check at 65 years old. And it was... Um, it was a horrible day for her, and I could tell it was. She, she looked at the check, she looked at the amount, and, and tears started well up in her eyes, and she started crying. And I know what the realization was. The realization was, I'm going to have to keep working. I can't retire. I, I can't stop working. I, I can't live off Social Security. So in that moment, I made up my mind to take complete and total care of my mother. So financially, you know, I'd, I'd give her five ten thousand dollars $10,000 every single month, which was way more than she'd ever earned in the course of her lifetime working three jobs. The thing about my mother, though, is that she had decades of the experience of just getting by of there being no money at the end of the month and right. so it didn't matter how much money i gave her on a monthly basis at the end of the month it was always gone it was either yeah. gifted to other people or it was frittered away or whatever it was just always gone and, and I'm, I'm positive that our financial success in life is directly tied to our own self-esteem that when your self-esteem is brought up when your confidence levels are brought up then what happens is is you automatically start producing at a higher level because you value yourself more. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. It's 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 so it's so interesting. One of the books that really convinced me of that I read uh, Psycho Cybernetics a while back by Dr. Maxwell Maltz, and and I realized that like you can't escape, you cannot escape what your subconscious believes about yourself. You can only and you can't directly influence it, which is kind of interesting to you know. That about hypnosis because because you're indirectly influencing it right there or, or there, there you're attempting to directly influence if someone else is but but we we almost put have to put ourselves under a self hypnosis in order to be able to I think that's where like the things kind of the weird stuff like affirmations and stuff it actually works because you're 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 getting through that self conscious that unconscious mind and, and changing it what do you think about about the that kind of that kind of thinking in that way. Well, I guess, you know, the real question that, that I'd be asking here is, how do people do this? How do people change that about themselves so that they they don't see themselves in that limiting belief or that, that limiting way, that mindset that is gonna cause them to never rise above to, you know, is to, to their thermostat. How do they change their thermostat? That's that's the question I'd, I'd like well, to know. And the challenge is that thermostat got set by the time a person was eight years old. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take a child from the time it's born until it's eight years old, and you say to that kid, you dirty, rotten, good for nothing. You will never amount to anything. You were a mistake. We wish you'd never had you. You're going to be a criminal. You're going to be a drug addict. You're going to end up dead or in prison. Nobody's life is better because you're here. We wish you'd never been born. If, if you talk to a kid that way from the time they were born until they were eight years old, and then that abusive authority figure was taken out of the picture, gone forever, right. it's too late. That, that person is damaged goods. And the challenge is is that person could spend a lifetime believing those truths because their mind was so malleable, it was so ready for the programming. Yet if you took that exact same child, no distinctions whatsoever in its, in its life, and instead, from the time it was born until it was seven or eight years old, you said, you are a gift from God. As yeah. you grow up, you'll do great things, you'll touch many people's lives, 
Uh, you'll become very famous. You'll become very rich. Everything you touch will turn to silver. If you took that job <laughs> from the time they were born until that, that age, and then that positive element was removed, yeah. it still will last a lifetime. You know, I've got, I've got three babies. I've got uh, sterling silver, maximum silver, and prosperity silver, uh, six, four, and two, respectively. And it's just been fascinating to me to be able to watch a clean slate and see what a clean slate does, see where a clean slate comes from, one that doesn't have all the baggage and all the heartache and all the pain that everybody goes through. And right. that, therein lies the challenges that, you know, most of us, you know, I had both of those experiences growing up. Unfortunately, my father was a man in pain, and he was the former. And right. my mother was a goddess and an amazing woman and really good for her kids. She was the latter. So when, when I was growing up, you know, I, I did magic it through from the time I was seven through my teen years. And I, because I did it a lot, I was really good. So I'd get on stage and at you know, 16, 17 years old, I, I'd do my magic act and I'd slay it from the stage. And you know, teenage girls would come up and say, oh, you're so cute. We should hang out. And we'd trade phone numbers and I'd give them a call and we'd go hang out. The challenge was when I was on stage, I was mega confident. When right. I was off stage, I was not. We were broke. I was still wearing hand-me-down clothes, and, and it wasn't fun. And within five or ten minutes, I could see the girls' eyes blaze over. And the look on their face was, who are you? And where's the guy that I saw on stage? Yeah. And so one day I had to ask myself the question, you know, which guy are you? Are you, right. this, are you this underconfident guy who fakes being confident on stage, or right. are you this confident guy who fakes being unconfident off stage? And the answer was real simple. I'm both. And, right. and I realized that if I was both, I needed to ask myself this question, which is the better one to be, both right. on stage and off stage? And so when I asked myself that question, I became this guy. And so you know, everybody that's watching this broadcast right now, one of the things that I, I want you to ask yourself is, is we can believe anything we choose to believe. You know, people that, that hold, uh, that have neuroses and believe things that, are, that other people say are not true, who says it's not true? I wrote a movie. It hasn't, hasn't yet been uh, produced, but the, the script's done. And it's called An Ordinary Man. And it's about the second coming of Christ in modern time. He comes back as a stage hypnotist and a seminar leader. Mm. Except through the course of the script, they do the exact same thing to him all over again. They just kill him. The government sees that he's become too powerful, and they just kill him. And uh, the opening scene, though, the lead character, his name's Chris Temple, he's walking into a, an, in, an insane asylum, and he walks up to a window, and he's been... Uh, He's been hired to help this guy who believes he's Jesus Christ uh, come to reality. And so he, wa he walks up to the window and he's looking in the window. And there's this old man sitting on a bed and he's swinging his legs. He's wearing just a, a hospital gown. And the hospital, the doctor, the MD is looking through the window, shakes his head. He says, yep, the guy believes he's Jesus Christ. And Chris Temple character looks at the doctor and says, well, is he? Because right. that, that's one of the things that sometimes people don't stop and think about is what if everybody else is crazy? And the one right. everyone's going crazy is the same one. But the, the, the point I was making in this is if we get to choose whatever reality we would choose, I say finding your life less than perfect is a waste of time. I it, love that. I it love is what that. it is. And so we've got to surrender to our circumstance. And then what we've got to do is we've got to utilize what's going on rather than tolerate. You don't want to put up with stuff. You want to say, okay, my flight is delayed two hours. Who at this airport am I supposed to meet talk to and it'll alter and change the course of my entire life or you know or or your 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 spouse does something or your girlfriend or boyfriend they do something that seems really wrong and you stop and you go well, what if it was right I, I was married twice before my one true wife and i mean that in every sense of the word that erica is my one true wife yet i'm very glad i was married the other two times because had i not been married those other two times particularly the second marriage which was really bad I would have no way of knowing what an amazing blessing my wife is. I certainly wouldn't have three children. I wouldn't be where I am today. And I wouldn't have all the joy that I experienced had I not found those perfect and said, okay, don't dwell, move on. What's the good stuff here? Right. Yeah. It, it's funny. I was just telling my daughter the other day, I was just telling her she's six years old. Her name is Sophia also uh -huh. with the name. And, and I was just telling her what, cause she didn't want to do, so she didn't want to eat some vegetables or something. And I said, you know, when I have something in my life that I have, to, I know I have to do, that it's forced upon me, whatever that, it's just, it's what happened. I decide that I made the decision for it to happen. Yep. <laughs> I, I go a hundred percent, because if I'm gonna have to do it anyway, and it's gonna happen to me anyway, I go, I pretend like I chose it. 
and and then I live my life that way. And it's it's something that I've practiced a lot, and it, it's it's exactly I, I, I see the mirror in, in what what you said there. And it's it's such a powerful con- people don't realize that they have this ability, and and to accept that this and and oftentimes I mean I I get a little bit of flack for this on on the channel, but I said I don't believe in coincidences, and I honestly I think that everything happens for a reason. Now whether you think that's God or whatever universe or, or whatever the reason is, I don't, I don't know. But I, I do know that 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 my life has been filled with too many things that have direction to, to believe that it's all random. I would agree. And, and that's the study of perfection. Like I said, finding your life less than perfect is a waste of time. It is what it is. And uh, I would also agree, you know, part of what I see happening for people that don't get what they want is they consistently play that victim card. Right. They consistently yeah. say, oh, you know, if only this were different or that was different or if only, you know, she had been elected president rather than him, everything would be really different. And the thing is, no, it would be the same in their lives. It would be 100 percent the same in their lives because that's what people do. You know, I, I, I go on record as being a Trump supporter. I always was. I've shared the stage with Trump. I've shared the stage with Hillary. You and I both know me even saying that out loud. I instantly get resistance from whoever might have right. a different opinion. I don't care. Right. Anybody, anybody that wants to live a better life should just pray that their president does a good job. I don't care who they are. Right. I was asked two days before the election, you know, who's going to be elected? And I said, you know, just looking at the, the rallies, you know, I know how hard it is as a seminar leader to put butts in seats. And I'm watching yeah. one guy have rallies that have 10,000 people in them four times a day. And I'm watching, you know, Hillary doing rallies that have three or 400 once or twice, once every other week. I said, that's the popular vote. I swear that is. I said, and I have not believed in our political system for a long time. So I think Hillary is still going to be president. I think that's, I think it's ordained. I think that's what's going to happen. So here's the thing for me, though, is that I had surrendered already and said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up and I need to take care of my children. Regardless of what's going on in the world around me, I've got to take care of my children. I've got to keep my nose to the grindstone and do my job. And I think right. that all the, 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 all the stuff that's come up recently and, and people really, making everything else responsible for them getting or not getting what they want, that's the danger. Right. Exactly. So when we, when we can be personally responsible for everything in our lives, just like you said, uh, you know, a guy, guy leaves his apartment, goes to a seminar, comes back home, uh, sees that his apartment has been broken into, <laughs> and his very expensive computing system has all been stolen. Well, it's his fault. Number one, he rented that apartment. Number right. two, he bought those computers. Number three, he didn't install an alarm on his apartment, even though he could have, he didn't do that. Number four, he decided to post all over Facebook that he was gonna be gone to this seminar so everybody knew that he wasn't in his apartment and wasn't coming back till the end of the day. Right. <laughs> and so, again, we, we teach a program. I mean, I'd love to have you as my guest. You seem like an amazing energy, and I love having people that can spread the word. I teach an event called Turning Point, and it's a $3,000 retail, and I, I wanna gift it to you and a guest to come join me. And at Turning Point, we teach three things specifically. Number one, we teach how to turn up wantingness. And, and that's a really important thing is that, again, that Buddhist curse, may all of your greatest desires be instantaneously fulfilled. I had everything that I wanted. I had all the money that I wanted. I finally yeah. found the love of my life, and I was so satisfied. And I didn't realize that that was the curse. Yeah. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So the first thing we do is we teach how to turn up wantingness. For me, at this point in my career, the uh, wantingness has very little to do with me and everything to do with my children, everything to do with your children, everything to do with generations to come that need our help. We, it, we need as entrepreneurs to rise up, take back our planet from, from in due respect, the politicos and the powers that be that would manipulate us. And we've got to do that through capitalism. We've got to do that through entrepreneurship. We've got to do that by reclaiming our world by saying, look, just because you run the banks doesn't mean you run my world. Right. Number one, we've got to turn up the wantingness. The second thing uh, Turning Point does is it helps people to identify what are the programs in their brain that are faulty working against them, and how do you plant programs that would work for you in your brain? And then the third thing that it does is it teaches skills of communication because communication equals wealth. Internal communication it are the programs, the 1,500 words per minute. External communication is called influence. Everything that we want that we don't have, we're going to get from other people. So it's imperative if you are to be successful in life that you genuinely fall in love with other people. Yes, I 
totally agree. I would, I'd love to come. I, I definitely will, will uh, take you up on that invitation. Sounds, sounds great. I, everything you've said, your philosophy so closely aligns with mine. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I, even, even the, the Buddhist, I mean, I'm, I'm nowhere near as successful as you, but the, but I, for, from when I was very young, I, my dream was to retire young. And I did that about, about four or five years ago, I, I got, I have a bunch of passive income from real estate investment and I'm still working because I went to go live on a beach, you know, to, to live in Maui for two months and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I, I realized that, you know, and I realized what a curse it actually is to have, and I had some depression for, for some period of time as I was getting close to that goal. And I realized what a curse it actually is to get everything that you want and that you got to have a higher purpose in life. And that's, that sent me on a, a, a totally different mission and, and path. And I'm so much more happier and so much more fulfilled. And to be honest, if I lose everything tomorrow, I'll still be just as happy and fulfilled. I get it. You know, and I think that's one of the things that people don't realize is that if you are miserable without money, you will be more miserable with money because the money won't make you happy. Exactly. Um, uh, when I was poor growing up and then I made many, many millions. I had a 1994 was a huge year for me. My infomercial hit. We did 120 million in the first uh year in sales and so that just changed my whole life it allowed me to move to vegas open up my huge production show in vegas uh as things do life goes up and down it went down i married the wrong person i lost that whole fortune found myself mil a million dollars plus in debt wow built the fortune back up again uh the economy shifted uh this is after i met my one true wife the economy shifted and went through some really tough financial times myself crashed everything again and uh, then turn it around again. And, and I'm, again, as far as perfection goes, there's a part of me that's actually glad that it happened that way. Maybe not quite as severe, but the reason I'm glad is that my wife met me when I was you know, worth millions and millions and millions. She's flying around with me on private jets. She's living, you know, like I said, in a palace and multiple homes all over the place. And when the, my personal economy changed, when a lot of people's personal economy changed back in 2010 through, heck, last year, the, the thing was, she never left. She never wavered. And so yeah. for me, it was a really great reassurance that she wasn't in the ride for the money. She was in the ride to be with me. And you know, she said, look, Marshall, we could sell everything. We could live in a one-bedroom studio apartment with the boys, and we could have one car, and I would be happy. I just want to be with you. So realize there's no pressure on you. None of this matters to me. And, and again, uh, I think that part of, of having it all and then losing it and having it again, you start to realize that everything is temporary. Right. Yeah. If everything is temporary, you might as well learn to be happy. You know, sometimes I'll get the question, uh, I'm scared to death of flying. Can you help me with that? And my yeah. response is, I doubt that you're scared of flying. I think you're scared of dying in a plane crash. Is that right? And they say, okay. I say, well, first and foremost, you realize how slim that possibility is, that, that millions of flights take off every single year, and very few of those flights ever crash because of the maintenance done, because of everything that goes into keeping you safe, particularly in this country. I said, so... That being first thing is you're not likely to crash. Even if you were likely to crash, if you're going to crash, you're going to die. So worrying about it won't slow it down at all. You might as well enjoy every single moment until you die. Exactly. If you're not going to die, worrying about it won't make your life any better. So you might as well enjoy every single moment until you do. And that's kind of the way that, you know, anything in life that creates anxiety, which is a worry about the future, or depression, which is a, a concern of the past, that's not living in Satori. Satori is to be in the present moment. And so when yeah. people can come back to the present moment and say, okay, here's what I do have. Here's what I do know. Here's what I can take action on right now. And start taking action on the things that they can. Start surrendering the things that they cannot. Then what happens is everything becomes better. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it's funny that you use the, the, the plane. I, I was actually very afraid to fly and I got over that, that fear of flying. But I always use the phrase now that the cabin door is closed. And because what, one of the things as I was overcoming my fear to fly, as, as I realized, is that once the cabin door is closed, it doesn't matter how worried or what, it's, it's the closed. fate is sealed. It's yeah. sealed. <laughs> Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I have no control over it at this point. And then I realized that that, that was a metaphor for life, was that the, the cabin door is, is, is closed. Is, it's, that was at the beginning of life. It was, it was to some degree that, like, I'm here for the ride. And so the good, you know, fit, fortune comes and goes and fate happens and, and whatnot, but I'm just going to enjoy the ride the whole entire time and, and not worry about it because that's just the only way to live. It's only an illusion that, that a lot of things we think we have control over that, that we do when we don't, you know, and, and yeah, that's fine. And Gandhi certainly was a classic example 
of showing how much power there is in surrender. Yes. Yeah. You know, like I said, you're, you're at the airport and the, uh, your flight's delayed two hours rather than getting upset and go, Oh my God, I'm going to get in so late. And I'm going to miss dinner with my friend. Your brain has to say, okay, it, it's delayed. Unless I can find another way to get on a different flight, I need to surrender. And these next two hours can either be miserable or they can be really good. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the challenge for people is that they, they allow themselves to be controlled by outside forces and keep giving their power away. The expression is forgive, and some people say it's forget. I'm not one that can forget things. I can forgive, though, and choose to remember no more. Right. Nelson Mandela, you know, spent decades wrongly accused in prison. When he was when he was released from prison uh, and made president, he was asked, you know, do you are you vengeful toward the people that locked you up? And he said, no, I refuse to let them lock me up another day. Wow. Yeah. Powerful. Yeah, it is powerful. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting. I mean, along this, those lines, one of the things that really stuck with me, too, is, is a quote. I said at Tony Rama's seminar about two years ago at the Date with Destiny, and he said, um, this was the thing that just changed my life. He, he said, uh, the, the, the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty you can comfortably live with. And that, that really shook me to the core was that I was trying to build all this. I was trying to make my whole life certain. Like, like I was trying, like you said, like, you know, if something goes wrong and then all of a sudden I, I'm panicking, I'm upset. I'm right. And, uh, and I think that's, I, I've just learned to let, let what, what comes, comes, whatever consequences come. And yeah, that's, that's the thing about certainty for me is that it's all semantics. For me, certainty is knowing that it's unfolding perfectly. Right. And yeah. 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 And so you can't, you can have it all. You can be certain and still have this life that the adventures and, and unique circumstances come up. I say it a little bit differently. And okay. to me, um, your success in life is in direct proportion to your desire and willingness to ask for and embrace more stress. You know, some people <laughs> are working toward a stress-free life and that's all well and good. There's a moment where you have absolutely no stress, that moment when you die. Right. The thing about it is, though, everything exists because of its resistance to its polar opposite. Light exists because it resists darkness. Love exists because it, re it resists fear. And so when we can understand that everything exists because of the resistance to its polar opposite, then you stop getting angry at the polar opposite. You know, again, right. I'm not angry at my ex-wife. If anything, I'm grateful for her being, in my experience, such an unpleasant person. I am grateful that I have seen being broke. I have much more sensitivity to helping people. I've also, you know, been up and down that road so many times that I could take anybody, any one of your viewers, any one of them and make them a millionaire within one year because it's not difficult. It's math. You know, right. you take a look at the people. Uh, one, one of the things that I see inside podcasting, heck, even inside of seminars, uh, internet seminars, is often people will hold a seminar and they'll say, this is not a pitch fest. Nothing will be sold. <laughs> and my response to that is, why would you curse these people and right. have to believe that their lives can be better if nothing is sold? The right. Only thing their life can be better is if something is sold. Exactly. Yeah. That that's so funny. I I get a lot of flack in the in the programming community for being a marketer, for being an internet marketer. But you know what? Every it's mostly most valuable skill you can have in life is selling. And, well, and every day of your people, life, you're selling. The only people that will ever get angry at you are broke. Right. It's very true. Very it's like true. consider the source. You know, I um I did a conference a few years back, and and I, I've been on stage like I said since I was seven years old, and and I did a conference a few years back where I did my entertainment show at night, and I did my lecture the next day, and I was the platinum sponsor of this event, and the sponsor had said, you know, and I I paid a hundred thousand dollars to be the platinum sponsor of this event, and and he said, yes, you can sell, you can make up your sponsorship by selling from the platform. Mm -hmm. So I get up on stage and I do the show and we bring down the house. Everybody loves it. Um, I get up the next day and I start lecturing and um, it was a, it was a new media uh, conference. It was a conference of people that have podcasts and, you know, and do blogs and do all these kind of things. And as you probably know, most people that do blogs and most people that do podcasts, they don't market them properly. They don't have anything to sell. Yeah. And because they don't have anything to sell, they pour their heart and their soul and their being into this thing and they never make a dime. And then they get frustrated that this isn't making me money and I'm not garnishing advertisers. And my response to that is, if your phone isn't ringing, pick it up. If you're waiting for advertisers to sponsor your show to make your money that way and they're not sponsoring your show, you need to figure out a different way to monetize it. And that yeah. way to monetize it 
the shortest way to monetize it is have valuable products and services that meet the needs of the audience that you, uh, you know, that you relate to, that you appeal to. And my own belief is, is again, I love selling. There's nothing I love better than selling, maybe buying things. But those, <laughs> those that are afraid to buy are always afraid to sell. So those people that, that get angry, they get, there's some people that got angry in the audience and they started tweeting, I can't believe this guy's trying to sell me something. Then the promoter tweeted back, oh guys, I'm so sorry, I had no idea that he was gonna sell anything. I read the tweets later and I went to him and went, are you kidding me? I gave right, you yeah. $1,000, you gave me permission to sell and then you threw me under the bus? So yeah. it's, just, it's just one of those things that when people fall in love with this whole idea of trading commerce and they can embrace that thing and, and say, okay, what can I sell them? It, it's, not, it's not that people are angry about being sold. People don't like being sold things they don't want, need, or could, could see themselves using. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine I'm driving from Las Vegas to my house on the beach down in San Diego. And, right. and, and normally I would fly in a private jet. I waited too long. The charter wasn't available. I got to drive. I'm cool with that. It, it's a four and a half hour, five hour drive at most. The challenge is um, it's EDC weekend. It's electric daisy carnival weekend. And there's a hundred thousand extra cars going back to Southern Cal. And so I get in my car and a trip that should have taken five hours is on eight hours. And I'm only three quarters of the way there. I either need to get some coffee or I need to check into this motel or there's this little town halfway between three quarters of the way between Vegas and San Diego. And there's a motel there. There's a gas station there. There's a bar there and there's a grocery store. There's nothing else there. Right. And so I pull over and I pull up to the motel and I, I walk inside and the man behind the counter is the owner. And I say, how much to stay in your hotel for a night? He says, it's a hundred dollars. And I said, a hundred bucks. Are you kidding me? He goes, we're the only game in town. And he sounds right. remarkably uh, like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know what? I'll tell you what. Um, how about I take the hundred bucks? I'm going to put it on the counter. Uh -huh. Let me go back and check out the room. If I like it, I'll stay. And if I don't like it, I'll just come back in the hundred bucks and, you know, and, and get myself home. He says, fair enough. I no sooner get out of eye shot of this guy when he grabs my hundred dollars off the counter. He runs across the street to the bar. He says to the guy behind the bar, he says, hey, Bob, this should take care of my bar tab. Here's 100 bucks. Bob says, thanks, paid in full. Bob takes that money, and he says to the guy across from him, he says, Johnny, uh, here's the groceries we bought for the bar. Johnny okay. takes the money, hands it to the guy beside him, he says, hey, Mac, this is for the auto repairs you did on my car. Mac takes the money, he looks at the girl at the end of the bar, gives her a wink, and he says, you know what this is for. <laughs> he takes the money, she runs back across the street to her husband, who owns the motel, she says, right. honey, I want to repay you the $100 that I borrowed from you. Here you go. She puts it back on the counter. Right. I decide not to stay. I walk out of the room. I walk over to the counter. I pick up my money. I leave. Right. Every single one of those transactions was paid in full. The velocity of that $100 bill multiplied by six because it changed hands. Oh, what, wow. a lot of, what a lot of people don't realize is, is that that is how the world works. And so when I say every single thought has a physical response and that those that are afraid to buy are always afraid to sell, what happens when people are afraid to buy or be sold things, they have a physical response in their body that when they go to sell something, they project that physical sense out and that causes people to resist that. Yeah. Wow. That's a very powerful story. I've never heard it described that way. And I'm looking for the mental, like my, my brain is processing it saying, Wait a minute. There's something. There's a catch here. Did you just? Are you? Are you a mentalist or a, or or a hypnotist? Hypnotist. But uh, but but no. It 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 jives. It makes sense. That's it's true. That hundred dollars has served a, a huge purpose in a very short amount of time. And that's how. I mean, that's the abundance mindset, right? It's like we we've got there. There's plenty for everyone. It's not it's not a win lose game, uh, in, in in that situation. No, and we wow. have more money. We have more money out in the world now than we have ever had in the history of the world. We have trillions yeah. more dollars out in the world than we've ever had. The challenge is not the money, the challenge is the velocity, it's the lack of flow. Here, right. There's a second part to that equation that's equally as dangerous. The first part is the money's not changing hands. So the guy that sells, the guy that sells uh, drinks isn't selling more drinks, so the guy that sells groceries can't sell him more groceries, and he can't get his car fixed and all of the above. The bigger challenge though, is that in each of those transactions, every time I spend money with you and you spend money with them and it goes full circle, every single one of those transactions is taxed. Exactly, when our, friction. When our government is unable to tax a transaction because it didn't occur, the government will find new taxes, number one, 
and it will also find ways to to put out more fees and more fines. Yeah. 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 That imagine how how much the velocity would be had it not been for FDR. <laughs> had we had we uh, had we had had we didn't have the, the the taxing that that we have. I mean, we we'd have such a greater economy. I'm I'm with yeah. you on that one. Yeah, we really would, and I think a lot of people don't realize that 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 the lowering of taxes and the opening up opportunities to more businesses and, and releasing them saying, no, you keep your money is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If the company keeps more of its money and pays less in taxes, then that company will have the ability to pay their employees more money, spread the wealth, so to speak, and right. everybody wins. But you know, people that, that are hurt, people that are financially frustrated, I get it why they would be angry. I won't drive my Rolls Royce Phantom unless there's valet parking. I don't want to come back outside and, and see a key up the side of my car. And I get right. it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Eight, eight out of 10 people, when, when I pull up to the stoplight, they'll give me a thumbs up. Nice car. Yeah. One out of 10 people flips me off. And I'm going, I could be the driver. I could be the chauffeur. Why are you flipping me off? Right. The 10th person, though, does the smart thing. They pull up beside me. They motion for me to roll my window down. And they say, hey, whatever you're doing, could you teach me? And yeah. then that's the thing. You know, when I was growing up dirt poor, I used to resent wealthy people. And it wasn't until I found a mentor at 14 years old and I watched the mentor. He was nine years older than me. He reinvented what we now know is Halloween. He reinvented the whole process of Halloween. I watched him go from 23 years old in the course of six, seven years. I watched him become a DECA millionaire, you know, 20 times over just with an idea. And so that's the thing that I encourage everybody that is, you know, watching this program right now. You have million dollar ideas in your head. You are a millionaire whose money has not yet been deposited in your bank account. A couple of things have to occur. Number one, you need, number one, to fall in love with, with people. You also need to fall in love with selling things. You need to go study somewhere where you can learn how to sell things. And, and I encourage you, come check out Turning Point. You know, yeah. reprogram your desires, turn up your motivation again. Let me get inside of your head, take out all the programs that don't work, put all the good stuff in that does work. And then let me teach you the skills of irresistible influence. How do you get people to beg for the thing that you sell? Right. Yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you on that. I think selling is such a valuable tool and, and asset. And, and even, I mean, it's funny that, you know, in, in the space of programmers, they say, well, you know, everything should be free, it should all be, and, and, I, and I get that that kind of feeling, but they, they, their paycheck, they want to, they want to get paid to do yeah. their paycheck, right? Everyone wants to get paid for the work. And, and, you know, and, and again, even, even with my platform, one thing is like, I've got, I've got a few full-time employees here and part-time employees. And if I didn't, if I didn't sell things, if I don't have products that I'm selling, my reach would be like this. Right. <laughs> But I have more people that can help me build more content and reach more people and put out free content to more people and change more people's lives. And it's because I'm I'm willing to sell. I'm willing to, to do it. And I think so many people shortchange themselves, like you said. So I, I'm glad that you're that you're preaching this message of of, of selling and buying. I mean, yes, both of those things. So yeah. Let me um, let me ask you. I want. I definitely want to talk to you about something that you had mentioned uh, called the Certainty Project. This is this is something that seemed really really interesting to me. Uh, again, we 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 talked about different definitions of the word certainty, and I, and I, I like I like what you said there. What what is the Certainty Project? It's twofold. Uh, the Certainty Institute is a nonprofit that will establish certainty centers across the globe, starting in North America. Okay. And the best thing I can liken a certainty center to would be a church for entrepreneurs. A place where people that don't have two nickels to rub together, but they have the motivation, they have the desire, they could come and take absolutely free courses. The courses would instill in them the confidence and the self-esteem and the knowledge of being personally responsible and, and growing their lives and taking charge of their lives again. The nonprofit would also assist in, in feeding the homeless, uh, assist in re-educating people that maybe you know got down on their luck and want to get back up and need a meal or need a shower or need some clothes. Uh, when my mother turned 65 and I started taking care of her financially, she never stopped working. She still worked 60 hours a week until she passed. And uh, what she did was she volunteered at a homeless shelter for 20 years. And oh, so wow. that's very near and dear to me. And it's always been important to me uh, to fight this other cause. And more so now that I have kids, I also, the certainty centers will also assist in, in revealing, exposing, and healing people uh, from child trafficking. And again, it's something that, that as I've uncovered things and seen around me, seen things that, that are horrific and, and just so painful, having 
kids of my own now knowing that, that again, these young lives need to be protected. And the challenge is it is, I'm not going to say it delicately, it, it's the powerful elite that exploit this the most. And I find that repulsive and, I, and it angers me. And the best way to combat it is to first reveal it and then secondly, start chipping away at it. Because that's, that's how you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. The other piece though, Certainty Incorporated, you know, I, like I said, I've made a couple of hundred million dollars in my life and I'm very grateful and I, I live like a, like a king. The other thing for me though, is that I've reached a point where I definitely can share the wealth. And you know, when I get on a stage, I crush it. I, I acknowledge it. I've got an unfair advantage. I'm a really good hypnotist. Therefore, I'm a really good salesperson. So when I get on stage, I crush it. And for, for 32 years, all of my business has been word of mouth. It's all been through referral. And so when I came out of retirement, I said, you know what? We're going to share the wealth. We're going to get the economy moving again, one person at a time. And so we have a very strong affiliate program where we allow people that love our works, you know, love our seminars, love our programs to refer other people. And we pay out up to 50% commissions on two tiers. And so we have people, even as we've been testing this, that in a weekend, in two days, have walked out with six figures extra in their pocket, and they only brought a dozen people to the event. So wow. that is Certainty Inc., CertaintyInc.com. Uh, the audience can also go to uh, Silver, S-Y-L-V-E-R.com, and check out the other stuff that we're up to. And if they'd like to you know, assist either on the nonprofit side or have fun and make a ton of money on the profit side, then they're certainly welcome to do that. You know, I, I rent uh, seminar rooms out all the time, and we spend millions of dollars renting out seminar rooms. I thought, what if rather than giving the $20,000 to the Hyatt to hold my two-day seminar there, what if I gave it to this certainty center? Since they're a nonprofit, they don't pay any taxes on it. They can use 100% of that money for good works. Keep that money in play. Keep that money in the economy. Everybody can win. I love that idea. Yeah, I've, I very much like that idea. That's that's really cool. I I, it, I I get the name now of the Certainty Project because I, I'm thinking back to like the number one thing that kids need in their life when they're starting out, which is certainty, and that that shapes us their life. And so that I, that to me that has a, a special a special meaning. That's that's really cool. Well, and it has dual meaning. You know, if you if I ask you, are you living a certain life, or mm -hmm. are you a certain millionaire? Are you a certain father? You know, everybody yeah. talks about that certain person that did so much for them in their lives. And I say, okay, what if everybody could be that certain person? Wow. Yeah. 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 The, the person who brings the certainty to other people's lives. Absolutely. Awesome. You know, um, if I'm, I want to be respectful for your time, but if you, if you got, if you could indulge me, if you've got five more minutes, I, I would love to ask you one, one last question here, because you seem to be a very well-read person. And anytime I find a successful person that is, that is well-read, I, I love to ask them, what are their top books to recommend? You know, certainly people should read Passion, Profit, and Power by Marshall Silver. Definitely. I already, gave, I already gave another book that I uh, loved, and that is The, Self, the Virtues of Selfishness by Ayn Rand. Right. Uh, there's a guy named Michael Gelb. He writes books, uh, Innovate Like Da Vinci, uh, Create Like Edison. And I think that those are really amazing books that, that most people wouldn't have found and they should definitely check out. Okay. Awesome. And well, then, I appreciate it. You know, for me, okay. again, reading is an amazing thing. I think people should read. I don't think there's any better way than to once again be there in person. So, you know, I'm yeah. a fan. I, I spent a lot of money on going to seminars. And a lot of money with mentors. Like I said, I, I paid Branson millions of dollars to be in his presence. And every single time I've ever been in his presence, it has been way worthwhile to me. You know, hang out with some people that you can assist in and go find people that are operating at a level above the level that you're playing at and ask, how can I serve you? You know, and yes. that's to me, that's the thing is the, the more we serve each other, the more we say, you know, what do you need right now? What, what can I do to, to help your cause along? The more everybody wins. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And I agree with the in-person with this seminar. I've been, I've, I, I do a lot of seminars and conferences. My, I'd like to actually start doing some in-person ones uh, just from, from my platform, but because I, they're so valuable, it's that, that personal connection is so valuable. You know a guy named Steve Olsher? I don't. He's down in San Diego. He's holding a conference called the, I think it's called the New Media Expo, similar name. Oh, yeah. So he's holding a conference down there in San Diego. I think it's September. I am their keynote speaker, which is the reason I bring it up. And it's for, it's for people that, like yourself, either are looking for guests to bring onto their broadcasts and or people that are wanting to be guests on broadcasts. There'll be a whole lot of, of new media influencers there and I think a really great place for people to go. So if you're in the neck of the woods around that time, uh, check it out, Steve Olsher, 
is the guy running it. I believe it's called the New Media Expo, and it's going to be a really great time. I'm looking forward to being there. Okay, sounds good. Well, I know it's going to be good if you're going to be keynoting it. <laughs> <You're awesome. laughs> all right, man, man, this is uh, this has been really awesome. Like, I, I could I could talk to you all day, seriously. Uh, but uh, but I got I got to let you go here. I I'd, I'd actually love to have you come back sometime, and uh, and I. I I definitely want to take you up on that invitation to, to come out to one of your uh, seminars because, uh, you know, I, I really feel like I have a lot to learn from you. So, 100%. And I, I have a feeling and a sense that we're going to be long term friends. I, I, I would like that. All right, Marshall. Th thank you very much again for taking your time. And, uh, and, and yeah, and best of luck with it, with everything that you're, you're doing. I really appreciate uh, what, what your message and, and your mission. You're welcome, brother. I'll talk to you soon, John. All right. Take care. Bye now.